So, this morning, I get to um, share about uh, a subject that is not necessarily a fun one all the time, and something that, when I say the word, probably many of you are going to cringe a little bit, because you don't really like this thing. And this thing is called authority. And like I said, we don't necessarily always like authority, because authority often makes us feel like we are maybe a hostage or like we're like we're trapped like we have no freedom because we all want freedom right i'd i'd way rather be free than have all these authorities telling me what i got and got not to do that was great english like for example a couple weeks ago i'm uh, i'm road tripping to Manitoba, that's where most of my family's at, and we drove through the night so as not to waste any days on traveling, and if you've ever road tripped between Saskatchewan and Manitoba, you know that unless you're like really hardcore into agriculture, it can be a pretty boring drive, like there's not a whole lot going on, and so I would love to be free from that boredom, and maybe watch a movie while I'm driving, or, or, or be, f- be free to text or, or call people while I'm driving, but the authorities say that I'm not supposed to do that, and so I feel like my freedom is taken away, and kind of feel a little bit like a hostage, and I think we all feel this way a little bit at times, maybe for you, you have no problem with the authorities on traffic laws, but maybe you struggle with the authority of your parents, or maybe you struggle with other authorities like your boss who's always telling you what to do, and your boss's ideas are not even good, and (laughs) they're telling you things that are ridiculous, and you're like, I don't want to do what my boss is telling me to do. But, unfortunately, that's the authority. And and sometimes we feel like a hostage. We feel trapped from these different authorities in our lives, whether they're our parents or our bosses or the law or our teachers or pastors even. But the truth is, authority will never go away. See, when I was young, I thought, man, when, I'm just, when I get to be 18, when I'm an adult, then finally I'll have freedom. There will no longer be any authority in my life. But I discovered that's definitely not true. And, and the adults are laughing because they know that that is also true. Authority will never go away. And so what do we do with authority? How do we look at authority in a healthy way? How do we learn to see authority and and respond to authority in a way that we're not going to feel trapped? Is it possible to even find freedom in authority? Today we're going to look at uh, a man from the Bible, a man that is really cool to learn from because he lived an incredible life. And if you don't know his story, I would encourage you, after we're done here today, sometime today to check out his story because God does some pretty amazing things in his life. And he deals with authority in in such a healthy and respectful way that we can learn from. And he has a, a secret, I believe, to why he's able to respond so well to authority. We're going to check out the story of Daniel. And we're going to look right at the beginning in chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. If you want to read along in your Bible or your YouVersion Bible app or whatever. And what we learn from him, him today, I think, has such value, whether you're a Jesus follower or not, whether you're this big, huge rebel and you hate rules, or you're a police officer. 
there's value for us today if we put into practice the truths that Daniel learned. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 1, it says, During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar, can you guys say that? One, two, three. Oh, that was pretty good. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah. Now, this is something that's interesting because those of you Bible scholars in the crowd know that Judah, those are God's people. And so you might be confused as to why would God give this ungodly king victory over God's people. That, that doesn't really make sense. That's a little counterintuitive. Well, I'm glad you asked the question because let me, let me tell you why this happened. See, I'm going to give a quick overview of the Old Testament. So if you've never read it, listen up closely. You don't even have to read it after this. Just kidding. So way back near the beginning, God comes and appears to this guy named Abraham. And he promises him that he's going to have more descendants than there are stars in the sky. He's going to bless him with all kinds of kids. And this is an amazing promise because Abraham's like 90 years old and doesn't have any kids. And his wife is also really old. And so, sure enough, God's promise comes true. And they're able to have a son. Son's name is Isaac. Isaac has a son. His name is Jacob. Jacob ends up having 12 sons, who we now know as the 12 tribes of Israel. And these 12 sons have a buttload of kids. And over time, there's like millions of these Israelites, we call them. But the problem is, they're slaves in Egypt. Being a slave, not a good thing. And so they didn't like it. And so they cried out to God, please rescue us, save us from these Egyptians who are enslaving us. And guess what? God saved them, just like they asked. And he came in and did all kinds of crazy miracles, and it's a wild story, and if you don't know that one, check out the book of Exodus, it's awesome. And so he rescues them out of Egypt, and he all of a sudden gives them these these decrees, these rules, these laws this way to live, that if they follow this way to live, they're going to find life. They're, they're going to live the best life possible, and God's going to bless them like crazy and give them these awesome lives. But if they choose instead to ignore him and to go and worship other gods, gods made of wood and stone, then he's going to punish them, and life is not going to be good. And over and over, they reject God, and they go out and, and worship other gods and do all kinds of sinful things that God doesn't really appreciate. And so over and over and over again, God sends people, he sends judges, and he says, sends prophets to come and say, listen, you guys got to smarten up. You got to stop worshiping these gods made of wood and stone. Like, you created this thing, and now you worship it. Like, what's wrong with you? You've got to worship God, the supreme being. Stop mistreating people and taking advantage of people and, and stealing from people. Start taking care of orphans and widows. Look after people. Be kind to people. Take care of other people. But they didn't. And so God said, fine, enough is enough. I'm going to exile you to the land of Babylon if you don't listen to me. And they didn't listen. And so this is where King Nebuchadnezzar comes in. And God uses this ungodly king, and he sends him into the land of Judah to overtake it, to capture its people, and to destroy the land. Check out the rest of verse 2. It says, The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah, and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. 
So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylon and placed them in the treasure house of his God. See, this is what's amazing, is that he doesn't even worship God. He's got some other God, but God is using him to perform his own purposes. I love it when God uses people who aren't on his side. Verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. He said, select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men. Make sure they're well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. Verse 5, the king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. So the king takes these people from Judah, and it's the royal people, the nobles, those who are really intelligent, good-looking. He takes them, and he puts them into this this training program for working in the royal palace. And he even takes food and wine from his own kitchen for these people. Now, the food from the king's kitchen, I would imagine, is probably some of the best. And so some of you would be like, oh, man, sweet deal. I'm in. That sounds great the best steak in the kingdom, I'll take it. Um, But Daniel wasn't really into that. And he decided instead to to do something different. See, this, this whole process of this ungodly king coming in and taking over, there's no record of Daniel rebelling or or trying to run away, or trying to disobey authority. But he was respectful to authority. He did what he was asked. He followed the rules. He obeyed. Until it came to something that disagreed with the worship of his God. He wasn't okay when they asked him to do something that went against what his God commanded. And We find it in verse 8. Still, Daniel's response to authority is incredible. Check out what he did. It says, But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He was determined not to defile himself. That's, That's some pretty strong language. And so, he picked up his plate, He threw it on the ground. He said, I'm not eating this unholy food. Now, if you don't know how the passage goes, you think, yeah, that fits. That makes sense. Why wouldn't he rebel against the authority like that? But he didn't. He didn't do that at all. And instead, he was very respectful to the authority, even though he disagreed, even though it went against what he believed. Look at how he responds instead. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. He asked the chief of staff for what? Permission. He didn't start shouting and demanding, saying, this is how it is, and I'm not going to have it any other way. He asked for permission. He was respectful to those in authority. Verse 9. Now, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel, probably based on Daniel's character. But he responded, I'm afraid of my lord the king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. So the chief of staff doesn't necessarily have a problem with Daniel's request, except that he's a little bit concerned if the king finds out that 
it was his decision to change the food that Daniel was eating. He's like, I'm not willing to lose my head for this, literally. I'm not going to die for this. But at the same time, he didn't necessarily have a problem with Daniel doing that if there was another way that he could go about it. And so Daniel, with partial permission, verse 11, Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he said, please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. And the attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. And we shouldn't be surprised that God honored Daniel's decision. That he honored what Daniel and his friends did. Verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. I love this story of Daniel. It it would have been so easy for him to rebel, for him to just take off, to to run away, or to make a a big show, a, a big deal about it. But he's so respectful to the authority that's in his life. And he chooses to submit, to respect even such a a notorious and ungodly king as Nebuchadnezzar. This was a a king who who came in and after capturing a king of Judah, he then also captured all of that king's sons and murdered the king's sons in front of the king's eyes and then gouged out his eyes so that that was the last thing that he saw. That, that was the type of king that Nebuchadnezzar was. And yet, Daniel respected that king and submitted to that king. And so, you wonder, like, how, how was Daniel able to do that? Like, how could you do that with such, such a terrible authority figure over you? How could you have any respect for that person? Well, I believe the answer is found in the book of Daniel, one chapter later. And it it was in Daniel's view of authority and where it came from. Verse 20, he said, Praise the name of God forever and ever, for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. When I read that verse... It makes me think of a chessboard. If you've ever played chess, you know that there's all these little pieces, and it's pretty easy for us to pick one up and move it around. And that's how easy it is for God to set up kings and to remove kings and to move people around because we are so small and so tiny compared to him. And Daniel knew that God was in charge, that God was the ultimate authority. And it was only because he knew that God was the ultimate authority that he was able to respect the authorities that God had placed above him and way below God. Because he knew that God was the ultimate authority. And the Apostle Paul also understood this very well. Check out what it says in the book of Romans. Paul writes, everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And they will be punished. Both Daniel and Paul recognize that when I rebel against authority, I'm rebelling against God because he is the ultimate authority and he has placed those authorities in our lives. 
And so if we rebel against authority, when I rebel against authority, I rebel against God. And that's why this authority thing is such a big deal. Because when I rebel against my boss, and I never would because there's no reason ever to rebel to a perfect man. (laughs) That's for you, John, when you're watching this later. No, but when I rebel against my boss, I'm not just rebelling against my boss. I'm rebelling against God. When I rebel and and ignore traffic laws, I'm not just rebelling against the traffic police. I'm rebelling against God. When I rebel against my parents, parents are going to love this one, when I rebel against my parents, I'm not just rebelling against my parents. I'm rebelling against God. And that's huge, and that's, and that's <laughs> scary, because suddenly we've got to treat authority a lot better than we sometimes do. And we don't always want to. But that's why it's so important to recognize where authority comes from. That God is the ultimate authority. And any other authority is placed there by God, Below him. If the band could come up, that would be awesome. So, what do we do with this? What do we do going from here? Well, Paul's suggestion would be submit to governing authorities. Submit to those who are in authority over you. Respect them. Honor them. Do what they ask of you. Is this always easy? No. Definitely, definitely not. And the problem is that in what Paul says here, when he says submit to governing authorities... He doesn't just say, submit to those in authority who are really respectful or or really kind to you or they're really deserving of respect because they're such an admirable person. Or you just have to respect authority when, as long as the rules that they make kind of fit in line with what you think is reasonable. He doesn't say that. He says, submit to governing authorities. There's no asterisk in there. There's no unless this. Or, but you got to break if, if the guy's like this. And that's hard because some of us have bosses or other people in our lives who can drive us crazy. And maybe we don't feel like they deserve a whole lot of respect. But God says they do. And because he says they do, if we're followers of Jesus, then we need to do that too. And the only exception to this is like in the situation with Daniel, when somebody in authority asks you to do something that goes against God's commands. But living here in Canada... That's not going to happen very often. It's not, it's not terribly often that we're asked to do something that goes against God's commands. And even when it does, like Daniel, we can choose to rebel respectfully. Not to make a, a huge deal about it or, or to make a big scene, but to be respectful, to ask permission. Submitting to authority can be such a difficult thing, and that's why submitting to God first and recognizing that He is the ultimate authority is such a huge part of this. And maybe some of you are sitting there and and you're thinking, I've never submitted to God's authority. I've never, never recognized Him as the ultimate authority in my life. And if you've never done that, 
and you would like to. I'm going to give you an opportunity to make that decision this morning. But that's a scary thing to do in, a lot, do in front of a lot of people. And so if you guys could close your eyes and, and bow your heads so that it's a little bit less intimidating. Um, God is the ultimate authority, and he is so much greater than any one of us. And compared to him, we're like grasshoppers, the Bible says. And yet, God sees such significance in us that he was willing to die in our place, to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could receive forgiveness and so that we could have a relationship with God. And if you want to have that relationship with God, if you want to submit to his authority in your life for the very first time, then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And then you can put it right back down. Thank you. You can open your eyes. I just want to imagine for a second every single one of us this week we do a perfect job of this we submit to authority like we never have before we show such respect to the authorities in our lives we honor them in incredible ways think about first selfishly what that could do for your life what uh, consequences you might be able to avoid from not rebelling against authority. I know some of you would probably like to take back a a ticket or two that you've had to pay for. Or kids, I'm sure some of you would like to avoid some of those consequences that you've had to face for rebelling against authority. But think beyond ourselves and selfishly. Think about what an impact you might be able to make on your coworkers when everybody is slandering your boss and and they're talking smack and you don't join in and maybe you even stand up for your boss who's not always a nice person and maybe doesn't deserve your support but you choose to support them anyway think about what a witness that can be on your coworkers. think about what an influence you can have just like Daniel if you read the rest of Daniel's story God gave him so many opportunities to point back to God. But if he hadn't chosen to submit to authority at the very beginning, I don't think he would have had those opportunities. I don't think he could have done the things that he did if he hadn't chosen to submit to those authorities in the first place. Think about the freedom that you could have, not having to look over your shoulder all the time, worried if you're going to get caught. You really can experience freedom when it comes to authority. But it actually comes in submission. As the band plays and sings one last song, I just want to give you a few minutes to to think about what it looks like in your life to submit to authority, who those authorities are, and how you can respect those authorities better this week.